Hello, ladies and gents. Welcome to episode eight of the Duo Work Show, where it is my job to interview professional and collegiate soccer players about their life journeys around the beautiful game. On this episode, I speak with Ale Haji Toure, a former men's soccer player at George Washington University. Amongst other things, we speak about his experience coming to America at a young age and having to adjust to a new country and a new culture, his D1 college recruiting process and experience, and how he was able to successfully balance playing a Division One sport, double majors, and recruiting for a career as an investment banker. I enjoyed this conversation and found it to be absolutely insightful, and I hope you do too. Ali Haji, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining me, man. Yep, thank you for having me. Excited for it. How are things? Uh, how's New York and how's the job? It's been good. Um, definitely a transition, but um, it's been it's been good. I've, I've enjoyed it so far. Nice. Uh, for the benefit of our viewers, why don't we start with some background, right? So tell us your full name, where you're from, and an interesting fact about you. Yeah, so full name, Alhaji Muhammad Tere. Um, I'm from Maryland. Maryland's considered my second home, but I actually grew up in West Africa. I grew up in a small country called Sierra Leone. Um, I guess my fun fact is that I I lived in London when I was like one years old. I lived there for like a year. That's really about it. Nice. And when did you come to the States? I came to the States when I was like 11, 12 years old. Um, came to the States, lived in New York for a year, and then moved over to Maryland where, as I said, I consider my second home. That's pretty dope. Uh, I moved here around, I think they're around the same age. Yeah. Uh, did you speak English at the time? And what was that adjustment like for you? Because I don't know, for me, it was a culture shock, right? Going from where I was, I was in Ethiopia to the US, I right? didn't speak the language. The weather was different. The culture was different. Everything was just very different. And it was a tough adjustment. What was that like for you? Yeah, no, it was it was interesting for me. And like, and I have two brothers, so it was interesting for for both for all three of us. Um, I did not speak great English when I came over to the U.S. And then I remember when I lived in New York, I lived in the Bronx, and I got bullied for my for my African <laughs> accent. So I got bullied so much so to the point where I would go home every single day and just read the dictionary, listen to anything on the radio, listening to music, watching TV shows and trying to emulate how Americans speak. So um, just, I, I got bullied so much that I would just take my time. I spent so much time reading the dictionary, going through every single page, reading the words and everything um, to, to perfect my English, my American, my American accent. And I think, I don't know, I, I think it's, it, it's done me well so far, but um, yeah, that's kind of, it was trial by fire for sure. <laughs> yeah no that seems like quite the experience there and obviously it wasn't fun while you're going through it but i think you played it to your advantage so kudos to you there i don't know you know the term african booty scratch was a thing <laughs> i was like used a lot when i was growing up in middle school but uh you kind of you know built i think you know, those tough skills um and you also like just become more empathetic because you <laughs> you know what it's like to be bullied and so i think it was a good experience for me and it looks like it was for you as well going back to soccer when did you start playing soccer? At what age was that? And who got you involved with the sport? Yeah, I, honestly, I don't even remember the first time I touched a soccer ball. Um, just growing up in Sierra Leone, it was like, go outside and just go play. Whether it's a soccer ball, a plastic bottle, a, a ball of plastic, whatever it was, you just go out and play. Um, and it wasn't anyone in particular that got me into it. It was just everyone in the neighborhood played. We had a field right across from my house, like your typical like dirt field in, in Africa. Um, you would just go there and play cleats no cleats shoes sandals barefoot whatever it was goals made of wooden sticks um and yeah we just we just got there and just play it very unorganized and i remember i used to always try to i remember my, my older brother would always play with like the older kids and i used to always try to go and play with the older kids my mom would always be like nah you need to stay home there's no way i'm like <laughs> um because they were obviously a lot more physical and i was like what six years old and they were like 10 to 12 years old so mm -hmm. i was just like, go and play as much as possible and um, my parents just told me, yeah, you make sure you stick with your age. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. And I guess you moved to Maryland, right? Um, when did you start playing organized club soccer, uh, while here in the States? Yeah, I started once I moved to Maryland. That was my first, well, I played a little bit of organized soccer in New York, but it wasn't anything serious. It was like very recreational, um, not actually competitive. And when I moved over to Maryland, I remember, uh, shout out to my mom for this but we were there and like <laughs> she knew that i loved soccer 
and she knew that I, I wanted to play on a team. Like I was, t- I kept on telling her, I want to play on a team. Like I don't know why we moved to America. I was playing, I was playing with my friends back home in Africa, all that stuff. And then she took me to the local soccer field, and she went up to every single team that was playing, went up to their coaches and asked them, "Hey, like, are you guys a local team? Um, are you guys a local team? Like, my son wants to play, um, and he's a good player." And I remember I was so embarrassed because I kept on telling my mom. To play. <laughs> No, don't go up to these coaches. Don't go talk to them. Like, they're not going to give you the time of the day. They don't really care about us, all that stuff. But she was the one that went up, and she went up to this one guy who was the manager of the team called OGGC that I ended up playing for for my whole time while in Maryland up until going to college. So um, she was the one that, that definitely got me uh, into organized soccer. At the time, I was like, Mom, you're going to embarrass me. But looking back, <laughs> it, was all, it, was all for, cause it was all from her. Wow, that's that's quite the story. Kudos to, to the mom there. It's, shout out to your mom. That's that's really dope. Did you stay with that same team um, throughout uh, your youth days? Yeah, I stayed with that same team from U twelve, U thirteen onwards. Stayed there for the whole club soccer experience. Um, I, the coach I had was second to none. He was from England. Um, he was a great coach. The teammates I had were very good. A number of them went Division one as well. Um, so it, it was just, it was just a great club, and it was close to home as well. And it was. I don't know. I enjoyed my time there. I felt like I developed so I developed a lot as a player there. That's that's really dope, man. And I remember for me growing up, right, the the state cup was the premier tournament. It yeah. was something that me and my teammates every year would look forward to. Right. It was an opportunity to showcase our talents against some of the best kids in the area. And you know, if you win there, you go on to play in the regionals. Yeah. And then if you win there, you go to nationals and play against some of the best kids in the con- in the country. Um, unfortunately, we never won the State Cup, but you had the the privilege of being able to win the State Cup. Uh, what was that experience like for you and and your team? No, it was it was amazing. Um, those were like it was such a great tournament. We beat a team called Baltimore Celtic in the final, and in the final we got to play in the stadium of the complex that it was at. So it was like a proper stadium, Bermuda grass, like stands and everything. And it was it was looking back on it, that was definitely the best memory I had in youth soccer. And those were like my friends. Some of those guys are my best friends to this day and just winning it with them was was amazing and then we went into regionals but then we lost to the to the people that ended up winning uh the national championship but it was it was definitely a good experience winning that and lifting that trophy nice nice it sounds like quite quite determined for you guys um it seemed like you had a great team right and probably why you probably didn't look to play at the academy level right so as i'm sure you're well aware a lot of the soccer players the division one level were former professional academy players because that level tends to just be better, right? You have better coaching, better players. You just develop better. Um, so a lot of guys looking to go play D1 and potentially beyond go the academy route. Uh, did that ever cross your mind? And and if so, why did you decide against pursuing it? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I mean, we especially in Maryland, we have a lot of academies in the area. We had, um, we had Baltimore Armor. We had Bethesda Academy. We had DC United. We had some academy academies in Virginia as well. But I don't know. I just I I thought my my club team was very good. We were able to compete with some of the academies. Even we played friendlies with them, and sometimes you able to beat them. Um, and I just I really just enjoyed my club experience, and my teammates all were still there. No one really had any urge to go to an academy because I, I still think we were a very good team. Um, and we always knew that we were going to get recruited no matter what. Um, obviously you get a lot more exposure at the academy level, but. Um, we thought that our team was good enough where it didn't really matter for us. Nice. That's really dope. And I think for young viewers, that's really important, right? Uh, I think if you want to develop and, you know, get better as a player, obviously you want to play the highest level. But, you know, there are some club teams that are competitive now with the academy teams. And, you know, if you're in a good environment, you you feel like you're developing and you can get scouts to look at you, right? D1 scouts come look at you. Um, it might be best just to stay there, right? Because one of the sacrifices of, playing the academy um, is you can't play high school soccer. Yeah. And that was, you know, some of the best moments of my, of my of my youth career. So it's something to be mindful of, right? The academy is great and develops its players, but it's not the end all be all. Yeah, exactly. When, uh, when did you start recruiting uh, for, D, uh, for, for college soccer and what did that process look like for you? Uh, I started like around my junior year. Towards the end of my sophomore year was when I was like starting to des- decide like if I wanted to play college soccer or not. Um, trying to really see like what opportunities are out there because my parents did not grow up in this country. So um, mm-hmm. I had to do a lot of research on my own. I had to ask my older brother, but he didn't play college soccer either. So I kind of just had to figure it out myself. 
Um, and then junior year was when I really started to, I, I knew, I, I knew I wanted to play college soccer. It was, it was, I don't know why in my sophomore year I was thinking maybe not, I'm not sure. I was like so focused on school that I was like, oh, maybe I should probably just pursue the school. But junior year I was like, yeah, I have to play college soccer. I can't imagine being a student without, without playing, without playing the sport that I love. Um, but yeah, I started out my junior year, just sending out emails, sending out my highlight tape to a lot of colleges. I really wanted to stay local as well. Um, but I, I shot my shot at a lot of different colleges and, yeah, it started my junior year and was able to commit my senior year. That's dope. Um, any advice for young soccer players, those are in high school, maybe in the middle school, thinking about being able to play in college and, you know, at the highest level, which is at Division One level. Yeah. Any advice for those uh, young soccer players? Yeah, I think the first thing is to take school very seriously because there's so many kids, so many kids that I know that could have been insane players in college. Like, insane but they just never really took school seriously and they never and they never even like did the bare minimum in school that was needed just to like coast through and kind of get into college a lot of these especially and it's funny because a lot of these really good soccer programs college soccer programs are also really good academic schools like Stanford, mm -hmm. georgetown uva like you have to have good grades to get into a lot of these schools so it's very important to take that seriously because that could that very well could be the deciding factor for a lot of these players um your soccer skills can only take you so far they can definitely get you looked at but if you don't have what's needed on the transcripts or you don't have the, the sat scores that that are needed then they'll probably just find someone else who can do what you do with the ball while also having good grades as well um and it's it's not you don't have to be like an, an outstanding student you just have to really just speak to the coaches and find out what exactly they need what type of grades they need what type of scores they need and just pursue that that's really it no, I'm I'm really happy you brought that up because I think it, it's so important. I think a lot of times, you know, young players can be you know a ton of focus on the sport, right, and getting better, and and that's that's important. You have to do that. But if you want to play at the college level, the grades also matter, right? And it's so unfortunate. I've seen, to your point, I've seen so many players, a lot of players I grew up playing with, super talented, could have yeah. went to some of the top top programs in the country, but just didn't have the grades. Yeah, and it comes back to bite you, and like. The coach can only do so much. Like, yeah. you know, if you don't have the grades, you don't have the grades. And so, like, make sure you focus on those grades. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you're finding a good balance where you can, you know, do well both in the classroom and on, on the field. But yeah. don't don't neglect those grades. Definitely. Um, what, uh, what was the adjustment like for you uh, to the Division One level, right? Um, I think for me personally, going from club to D1 soccer was quite an, an adjustment. I, I struggle with the pace of the game, the physicality of the game, and then just not being the star, right? Yeah. And that kind of had an effect on my confidence. And then I just started playing worse. Uh, and so I guess we'd love to hear your experience uh, with adjusting the D1 level. Yeah, no, it was it was quite the experience. When I first got at the Division One level, I I did not adjust very well. I remember my first game, I'm, I'm a center mid. My first game I got put in that, the first time I play, I get put in that right back. And I almost like, not concede a goal, but a goal almost came off of my mistake. And that was, and then I, I was on the bench for a few games and I was like, I was not used to being on the bench. So I was like, I have to do something about this. I, I can't, I can't keep like, there, there's no way. So I just really worked really hard towards trying to get that starting spot. But I think the biggest adjustment for me was coming from club. My club team was very, um, let the ball do the work, very possession based, like try to move the mm -hmm. ball by the open man, um, try to play through the midfield, try to connect passes. Um, and that was our style of play. And that's why I love my club. My coach, my coach is a great was a great coach in terms of that style of play in college it's a, it's a lot more direct it's just it's very much hitting the channels getting it out wide cross and let's score so really trying to adjust my style of play from being okay let's try to keep possession let's try to tire the other team out let's let the ball do the work to being a lot more direct and just being a lot more high octane a lot more intense and like high press win it off the counter boom let's go 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 um, and that, that was one of the reasons why I, that, that was the reason why I made that mistake when, on my debut was because I was trying to keep the ball. I was trying to play. And I guess my teammates did not have the same mentality. It was more, yo, let's get the ball up. We'll win the second balls and we'll try to get it out wide and try to score. Um, so yeah, definitely it's, it really was the style of play in terms of college soccer is just a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. Very direct, very physical. Yeah. Um, I guess taking a step back, right? You committed to play D1 soccer at uh, George Washington University. Yeah. Uh, why did you choose them over some of the schools that you were looking at as well? Yeah, so I I chose GW because not for a few reasons. First, it was close to home. I, I always wanted to be close to home. I wanted to be close to my family. I wanted to be able to go home wherever I wanted. 
And a lot of my mm-hmm. friends went to University of Maryland as well. So being close to them was good for me. Two, had a good soccer program. I spoke with the coach and the coach was, was a very nice guy. Very nice. Craig Jones, great coach. One of, the, one of the best coaches I've had so far. All my career is done, but one of the best coaches I've had, um, th- th- I had throughout my career. And then three, because they had an international affairs program. Um, I was a very good international affairs program. I wanted to go to school and study international affairs. And I knew that GW was the one place that combined my love for soccer and my love for international affairs at a high level for both. So um, that it really was, was, was the perfect fit for me. Nice. Um, and it seemed like it worked out for you. So kudos there. So on top of playing a Division One sport, you also a double major right? and were recruiting for a career as an investment banker. Um, so first, first of all, congrats on successfully balancing all those hard things. Uh, I know it requires a lot of hard work, the discipline to be consistent, and the grit to be able to kind of bounce back from setbacks. As you look back on your experience, what would you say helped you throughout that process and what could our viewers take away from your experience? Yeah, I think it's, especially in college nowadays, especially like, I'm, especially, yeah, especially in college, I think there's just so many distractions that you can never really, you can, you have to try to make sure that you always remember what the goal is, what the goal you had was. Um, I think if you go into college and you say, okay, I want to do investment banking. Um, and I think, I think you have to, first of all, you have to figure out your goals early. You have to find out what you want early. And the thing is, those are subject to change. Your goals will change every day, every other day, every month, whatever. But as long as you have a goal that you that you work towards and two, also just never really forgetting what that goal is. There's a lot of distractions in terms of your personal life, social life, family back home, friends, all that stuff. Um, but you can, you can never really forget the goal that you have in mind. If that goal is to go to get a master's somewhere, just don't forget that goal. If that goal is to go work in finance somewhere, to go work in consulting or to become a doctor, just no matter what distractions happen, just try to make sure that that I, I try to make sure that I would just never forget the goal that I had in mind for myself. Yeah, no, su- super, super important. Um, and I think I had a similar a similar outlook too. I remember in college, I was just laser focused on soccer, academics, and recruiting for IB. Like I, you know, I, I understood the importance of, you know, socializing and making friends and making memories. But I also like, this is a four-year thing. I, I want to ensure that I'm in a good spot once I'm graduating here and so I did like make sacrifice. I decided like, hey, I'm not gonna drink while I was in college, right? I would go to parties and I would go with my teammate, but I would be in bed by like you know 1:30 and I would be up by like nine the next day. I wouldn't. I wasn't up until like 1 p.m. hungover, right? So it was like some stuff like that where if you decide you you know you want to focus on a goal and you yeah. want to make sacrifices, you yeah. can't make it work. But you know, to your point, I think having having that goal in mind and sticking to it um, helps and it goes a long way. Yeah. Uh, when did you find out about investor banking and uh, and and who like put you on? Yeah, funny story actually. So I, as I said, I went to GW to study international affairs. I thought I was going to be like the next James Bond to go save the world through diplomacy. <laughs> and, um, got to the classes and it was like we were just learning a lot of history. That's what it felt like, and I really wanted to go into a field where you challenge yourself every single day. You learn something new every single day, and could ultimately replace the intensity that I got from soccer to my life when I'm done with soccer, basically. Um, so I, I was just looking at different areas, but that was during that time when I was thinking maybe international affairs wasn't it for me. I was actually on the bus um, going back to my dorm and some guy taps my shoulder and he's like, hey, like, what's your name? I had, I had a GW men's soccer backpack and I'm like, oh, my name's Al Haji. He's like, oh, you're on the soccer team? I'm like, yeah. He's like, oh, I'm on the track team as well. I was like, okay, that's cool. And we were just talking a bit and he's like, Hey, like, have you ever, like, what's your major? I was like, international affairs. And he's like, oh, have you ever thought about, you know, wanting to study finance as well? And I was like, honestly, not really. I don't even know how the stock market works. Uh, if you tell me what an investment bank is, I think, like, if you tell me you're an investment banker, I probably think you're a bank teller. Um, I had no idea how <laughs> it's worked. And he's like, hey, like, if you're ever interested, there's a very lucrative opportunities there um, in areas where you can learn something every single day. So if you're ever interested, just let me know. And then a few months went by and I was like, yeah, maybe I should just try it out. So reached back out to him. He's, he's my mentor now. His name's Joel Stennett. Um, and he was the one we, we met up that first time. I remember we were in, in a conference room and he started listing out a bunch of different companies, a bunch of different banks and telling me exactly what they do. And I had no idea what he was talking about. Um, but he was the one that got me into finance. He was the one that taught me a lot of what I knew at the start. Um, and shout out to him because he was the one that, that ultimately got me into the position I am today. But it was all because I was on that bus that one day and he was like, hey, dude, if you're interested in finance, just let me know. 
dude that yeah. that is crazy dude and that one little interaction changed your life forever dude like it's insane i had a similar experience where the start of my sophomore year i was in a touring center right because of soccer i'm traveling a lot missing classes so i was in a touring class getting caught up on some materials i missed and the guy that was giving me the touring lessons was an upperclassman who was also a double major in finance and economics like myself so i was like hey man what are you gonna do with your degrees and he was actually in the middle of recruiting for investment banking and that was the first time I heard about it. And just hearing him talk about how competitive that process was, it just yeah. naturally piqued my interest, right? So I'm like, what kind of job or internship require this amount of work and preparation? Yeah. So, you know, that night I did some research and I was like, wow, this is actually interesting. You know, it's a job that combines both of my interests in macroeconomics and corporate yeah. finance, working in a team environment with some really smart and very different people. Yeah. Uh, and I would be learning a lot. So the next day I went back to him like, hey man, like, you got to put me on, like, how did you learn, like, all this stuff? And yeah. how do I get to where you are? And he, you know, became, like, you became a mentor for me, gave me all these different guides, and it yeah. was, like, super helpful in navigating that process. And, like, I look back on the interaction, like, dude, the people I met along the way, um, my outlook in terms of what I want to do, uh, in terms of how I approach every day, uh, it just completely changed from just that one interaction. And so, like, I think it was, like, a few months ago, I was texting him, I'm like, man, like, you changed my life, man. Like, no joke. Like, like I, I don't know what I would be right now if it wasn't for him. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's, it's crazy how these little interactions can have big, big ramifications. Yeah. Uh, as you look back on your IB recruiting process, did any, like, doubts ever arise about your ability to break into the industry? I, I remember when I was recruiting, right, imposter syndrome was a real thing for me. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, it was actually at your firm uh, that this happened. So it was... The spring of my sophomore year, I, we were invited out to one of those insight series, right? Where they'll like select like six to seven people from across the country. They fly you in for a few days. You learn about the firm, the different divisions, you network. And it's, it was essentially like a pipeline for the internships. And I remember when I got there, I was super, super happy, right? Because the first few times I tried, like I fell. And I, I remember going to the event and they had us sitting in these tables, right? Of like six or seven people. Never had their name and then like their school. And I remember looking around like you know, <laughs> Yale, the, the Harvard, all these top, top schools. Yeah. And my name, you know, I went to a very small liberal arts school in, in Buffalo, New York. So like none of them knew where I went. Yeah. And then they had to do this case study and everybody was using so much finance jargon. It felt yeah. like they were speaking a different language. And I remember after that event ended, I'm like, like, what am I doing here? Like, how did they select me? I just felt so out of place. And I seriously like questioned my ability to break into the industry. And, you know, funny enough, a few days later, a mentor of mine, he sent me an article um, actually for this guy who had a very similar background as myself. And he actually just broke into banking uh, at that same bank. And dude, that was like all the validation I needed in the world. Like that gave me the letter oomph to like keep going. Yeah. So a long way of like asking you, like, what was your experience like? And did doubts ever arise as you navigate that process? And what yeah. did you do to like help you um, throughout that journey? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's interesting. Like, I share the exact same sentiment as you, and it's it's kind of funny when you're when you get invited to these interviews or you get invited to these like different conferences or insight series. You know, it's like some people will tell you like, "Oh, you're doing really well, you're doing great," but then like you deep down inside, you kind of have su such high expectations of yourself that you're like, "Am I really doing that well?" Even though a lot of other people are saying I'm doing well, it's like, "Am I actually really?" Am I really at the top of my game? Am I am I really am I really meeting the expectations I set for myself? Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's something that's very tricky to navigate, and it's just I think the most important the thing that helped me out the most with that trying to trying to battle that imposter syndrome, especially when everyone that you work with went to some sort of Ivy League or some sort of target school. I came from a liberal arts school. I studied international affairs. I, I came from Africa. Like I, I was not. I was not, <laughs> I'm not meant to be here. Like this is not this is not in the cards for me when I was born. You know what I mean? So like it's definitely. Had, I wasn't meant to be in any of these positions in any of these, even in, in college, I wasn't, I wasn't meant to be in any of these positions that I am, that I, I got to or that I am today. Um, so I, I think what helped me navigate a lot of that was just trying to have a lot of evidence-based confidence, not just confidence in, oh, like I'm, I know what I'm doing. It's confidence based on what I've done in the past. You know, I moved to the US. I didn't really have that much knowledge about the area, but I was able to learn English pretty well and able to interact with people pretty well. Move over to Maryland, was able to make friends from that. Um, was able to go play Division One soccer. Was able to adjust in that. Was able to become captain. Was able to go to a, a pretty good university. Was able to do a lot of things. So having a lot of confidence based in based on the evidence that 
you have done a lot of good things in the past and that if you continue to work hard, then you'll always win. No matter what, hard work will always win. So just having a lot of confidence based on the fact that you've worked hard in the past and there's been a lot of positive results and that once you continue doing that and you continue working hard and really just focus on what you on only, only on what you can control, then it makes it makes the process a little bit easier. The imposter syndrome will definitely come back comes back in here and there, especially when you're not performing that well. But I think it's just important to have to have confidence that's that's based on tangible evidence on what you've done before. Hey, I did this internship before. I got this offer before. Like I've, I've been in these positions before. I know what it's like to work hard. I know what it's like to grind. I know what it's like to to bomb an interview and then do another interview the next day and kill it. You know, like I I know what it's like to to do a lot of that. So I've been through all of this before. And I've been able to navigate that well. So whatever challenge comes next, you know, it's just trying to find a way to navigate that in, in a similar manner um, and to try to get as, as good of a result from it as possible. Yeah, yeah. Super, super insightful there. And I, I think to your point, being reflective of what you've done in the past, I think kind of helps you, right? Like reassure you like, hey, you're here for a reason. And I think for me it also helps to like realize that this is not just happening to me. There's a lot of people that are going through the similar experience where they're like doubting where they belong to. Um, and, and that like, I'm not alone in this. Uh, so uh, it's something I guess always helps me when, when I have those thoughts. Um, I guess as we wrap up now, this part of the, the, the podcast, uh, what would you say has been the highlight of your soccer career so far? I in my soccer career. Oh, I've had, I've had a lot of fun moments in my soccer career. I, do you mind if can I say a few? Can I say a couple? Or? Say say a few. Say a few. Okay. I guess yeah. Winning state cup is definitely that's definitely at the top of my list. There, I think that, that was such a great experience. Like, and I, that team was such a, our team was such a good team as well. Um, I remember we would always like look at the look at the rankings that would always come out every week or every month or whatever, and we would always be number one in the national ranking because our team was really good that year. So that, that was a fun year with that team. Um, two, honestly, just being able to get a scholarship to play at a Division One program, I think that was. Always the goal, just seeing how happy my parents were when I told them, like, hey, like, my college is getting paid for because I play soccer. Like, seeing how happy they were and how proud they were of me um, was was great. And that was, I mean, that, that's, those, those are people that motivate me. That, that's my number one motivation, my parents. Um, and then my third one is probably, honestly, yeah, pr- probably, yeah, Atlantic 10 tournament um, while I was at GW. Um, we made the finals. We lost to Fordham, but that semifinals when we beat Dayton, that was definitely a big high in my career because we were, it was top four seed went through and then we were the fourth seed actually. So like we were, and at, to start the season, we were ranked, we have, I think 13 teams in our conference and preseason poll, we were 12th, we were ranked 12th. Wow. So to go from 12th to making the conference tournament and then being the fourth seed in the conference tournament and then playing the first seed and then beating the first seed when no one even thought we were going to make this tournament was was great and it was like it was one of those games where we we definitely parked the bus we hunkered down <laughs> we, scored, we scored a goal off the counter i remember it was my guy sandro scored the goal off the counter it was a header and that's the celebration oh my lord the celebration was amazing and then the last like 30 minutes parked the bus to fend for your lives I, that was that last 30 minutes was, was the most fun 30 minutes of soccer i've ever played it was no soccer being played it was just get stuck in put a tackle here win your headers win your battles let's just let's grind this one out and then when the final whistle blew it was it was a great feeling and then being back on the bus celebrating with the team obviously we ultimately lost to Fordham but that was that was definitely up there with with winning uh winning state cup yeah dude those those hard fought victories yeah. where everybody's put in the shift right those those are so sweet and, and you know you look back on those and you're like wow what experience that was um on the flip side, what would you say has been the low light of your college career or your college, uh, not college, your, your soccer career? Yeah. Uh, low light. Yeah. I mean, I guess, honestly, uh, the low light of my soccer is probably not, not taking it as serious as I really wanted to. Um, because once I got to school, I, once I got to college soccer, obviously when you go to college soccer, you, you're, a lot of people like their goal is like, okay, let me see if I can play at the next level, you know? But then I got to college and I was like, probably I'm probably not good enough to play at the next level. And I have other stuff that I need to worry about in terms of like recruiting for for my job when I'm done with college, especially when the recruiting starts so early, you kind of have to focus on that. So I spent a lot of time just just trying to do that, trying to set up my, my life for after college, trying to set it up so that I can first provide for myself and honestly just make my parents proud. So I I, I took soccer very seriously, but 
I guess I, I wish I would have taken it as serious as a lot of the other guys who like for them, it's like, I'm only going to play soccer after college, no matter what, no matter what division it could be USL, NPSL, whatever it is. Um, I'm going to play soccer. And a lot of them, like they would take it very seriously and whatever extra time they had, it was extra training. Whatever extra time I had was going towards, you know, walk me through a DCF. It was going towards, <laughs> towards that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I don't think I've ever had any, I don't think I've, I think everything was just a learning experience for me in, in my soccer career. I don't think there was there were any, ever any lowlights. But I do think if I looked back on it, I wish I would have, I would have taken it like as serious as some of the guys who who really wanted to play at the next level. Yeah, no, that that's fair. But at the same time, though, right? Like trade off. You you taking it more, that means maybe you don't have much time to to do the DCFs and break into banking, right? So like I had a similar experience. I think after my freshman year, I was like, probably I'm gonna be done with soccer after college. Um, so let me like shift my focus. Like I go my freshman year, I was like after. Practice. I was training um, mm-hmm. before the preseason started. I was running a lot. I was like, you know, in the best shape of my life. Yep. I was putting in extra work. But then after freshman year, I was like, soccer probably ain't for me. Uh, and I shifted my focus. I, yep. And that gave me more time to like, you know, recruit for IB and, you know, which helped me break into IB. So I guess, yeah, I think it's it's straight off. But yeah, I'm, I'm sure I can, I can understand that sentiment there. Yep. Uh, I guess as we wrap up this segment of the pod, any advice, generally speaking, for for young soccer players? Yeah, I mean, I think it's like as easy as just, it's very cliche, but I mean, hard work will always win. Uh, that, that's really it. You, there's no secret formula. There's no shortcut to a lot of it. It's just hard work and a lot of a lot of reps. It, that, it's that simple. Um, I I'm, and I'm not speaking from my experience because I'm not the one that's playing professional soccer, but I do know a lot of guys that I've played with that are playing professional soccer that will be playing professional soccer. And it's the same for a lot of them. It's just hard work. Hard work will always win. Getting in as many reps as possible will always win. And just as I said earlier, just making sure that you never forget the goals that you have set for yourself. Those goals can change. Same thing for you and I, you know, coming to college, it's like, yeah, your, your goal now is like, can I play at the next level? You find out maybe not the goal switches to okay let me recruit to make sure that i have a good job when i graduate and i'm in an, i'm in a very competitive area where only what less than a percentage of people that apply are going to get an offer yep. you know? when your goal switches to that it's still the same thing there's no shortcuts in any of it for me that's that's what i thought it was just hard work always wins really that that's that's i think that's it hard work yeah hard work for sure for sure totally agree there we just add that yeah hard work combined with consistency yep. and discipline uh, you can work hard when you want to work hard like there's days where you're not feeling it you still have to do it and that, that's what separate the people you know that become allies and do well and those are like stay average so uh super super insightful there we'll switch to the next segment of the podcast now where i ask all of our guests these rabbit fire type questions yep. um so for the first question um best player you ever played with played with I'll play with some very good players. Um, I can't. I can't just single one person out, but I can name a few. I know Patrick Watkins played with him in, in club soccer. He was one of the best midfielders I've ever played with. Honestly, one of those people that you, yeah, if you ever saw him make a mistake, you would be like, "Is this real life?" Because he would never make a mistake, <laughs> never misplace a pass, never miss a tackle. Just such a good player and like someone that was so great to play alongside because he just did all the work for you. Um, another player, center back Marcelo Lodge, who he plays in the USL now. Played with him at GW. He was just a class center back, calm on the ball, great defensively. Like he he can he was just another one of those players on the ball would never lose it. As a center back, he would never just launch it forward and he would never lose it. He'd always find the right man, always find the open man. And he was just so great with his feet. Um he was a very good player. Um another one, Oscar Ames Brown. He played I played with him at GW, just crazy goal scorer. Like put a ball in like in and around the box anywhere in around the 18 he, he's just goals 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 like, it's insane he when i played with him my uh my freshman year that he was like the first person i saw in college soccer where i was like wow he was, <laughs> he was it's like literally anywhere you gave him the ball in and around the 18 it's gonna lead to, it was gonna lead to like some sort of goal scoring opportunity it was crazy another one elias norris this he played with him at gw now he's playing at uva he was a very good player as well very fast um, another player, Tom Cooklin, he's from England. He, oh my gosh, he actually led the NCAA in assists last year. Um, oh, he wow. was a great player. Now he's playing at Western Michigan. He actually just had four assists in one game at Western Michigan and he was on the college soccer. Four national, assists in one game. Four assists in one game. College soccer national champ, national team of the week. He, he's filled like on the ball, just crazy. And then 
another center back, Aaron Cronenberg from from Germany. We call him the Terminator. I played with him at GW. I mean, he, <laughs> he's just so good. On, he's so good on the ball and very good defensively as well. I played a lot of good players. I'm sorry. But yeah, I'm sorry. That's, that's what I'm getting from that. What is, <laughs> I guess on the flip side, best play you ever played against? Against? Oof. Hmm. Oh, Could Joe be Bell. High school. Joe Bell or Siad Hot. Yeah, I, I think Joe Bell. Joe Bell, I played him, I think it was my freshman year. Um, he, he was playing at UVA. It was the year where they won the national, or no, it was the year where they lost the national championship to Georgetown. That was my, yeah, I think that was my freshman year. And he was a center mid. He had already had like, we played him and he had already had like caps for the New Zealand national team. He was <laughs> insane on the ball. Like he would touch the ball once every, once every 10 seconds in the game. Like he was rap, he would move around. He was just connecting every bit of play. Like everything UVA did ran through him get the ball from the goalkeeper, get the ball from the left back, right back, center back, strike, get the ball from anywhere, wherever you wanted to put the ball as well, left foot, right foot, ping it diagonally, play short passes, one twos, try and play a through ball, whatever he wanted to do on the ball, he could do it. And he was like, he had like the lungs of a horse. It was crazy. Like he just never got tired as well. And he ran, cir- he ran circles around us. He was, he was definitely, yeah, yeah, I don't think I don't even think it's close. He's definitely the best player I've played. <laughs> Dude, I watched him. I watched the college cup. I think the same term you're referring to. Yeah. And yeah, he was just he was outstanding. Very simple, very effective. Yeah. Um, yeah, and he was obviously ahead of Joe's or ahead of everybody else. Yeah. Um rank these three players, right? Mbappe, Holland, and Vinny Jr. Oof. That is a great question. Oh my gosh. Oh, that is a great question. I, I mean, I think Mbappe is first for me. I, I think like if I mean, obviously, I'm sure you watched, but like that final, that that France Argentina final, that's what confirmed. Bro. Like the Bro. fact that you just turn it on whenever he wants to is insane. Create, score, whatever it is he could do, and like, I, I mean, I just I I think he just he's so unpredictable. I just think he's so good. I, I don't think, yeah, I think he's he's definitely heading. Yeah, I think he's definitely better than them. And the thing for me is between Vinny and Holland. I think Holland is a great school goal scorer, but Vinny, especially last year, the things Vinny, the things Vinny does on the ball, get him out wide, one v one, the way he creates, the way he just beats his fullback. I, I don't know. I, I'm honestly, this might be a hot take, but I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take Vinny, and then I'll take, and I'll put Holland at third. I just think Vinny is just, and Vinny is something that we that we don't see in the game that that often. You know, a lot of wingers nowadays are very like cut it back. You know pass it back, you know, let's try and invert myself. No, Vinny's like, give me the ball. Let me take on, I don't care if I have one guy, two guy, three guys on me. Let me take them on, have some flair with it, have some fun with it, and let me create or let me score. I think he's a special player. So I think maybe that just could be more preference for me, but I'll take, I'll do Mbappe. Mbappe's not, I don't think Mbappe's close to those two. And then I'll do Mbappe, then Vinny, and then Holland. No, no, that's a fair, that's a fair assessment. And I actually agree with you. Um, and I think it's, uh, it comes down to preference ultimately, yeah. right? Because they're all top, top players and, you know, Holland's a goal scoring machine. So if you just, you know, if you're a striker or you prefer guys that are banging goals, you might pick him. But I think just pure talent, I would have to like agree with what you've, again, is it fair to say just pure talent? Because that guy is talented. Like, boy, is built, like if you had to build a striker in a lab, oh, it would be Holland. It's him. Yeah. Right? Hundred percent. He's hungry for goals. Like you just see the way he runs, dude. Like, <laughs> Crazy. Uh, so yeah, I think I, I think I would agree with that. That same assessment you had. Um, give me your predictions for the top four finish in the Prem this year. I'm a bit superstitious, and I'm an Arsenal fan, so I won't put Arsenal in there. Because <laughs> if I put Arsenal in there, then we're not going to win top four. But I'd probably, I think City's going to win it this year um, again. Um. I think Spurs will come second. As crazy to say that as an Arsenal fan. Actually, no, I'll put, I'll put Liverpool second. Never mind. What am I saying? I'll put Liverpool second. Um, and I'll say Arsenal and then Spurs. That's if I had to give if I had to give like a like an objective view, I would say City, Liverpool, Arsenal, then Spurs. Although Arsenal, Arsenal tied today. I think Spurs have been very, very good this year. I think they're they're a dark horse right now. Did you see that game, dude? That game was Chelsea is so bad, dude. I was hoping you guys would drop points. Like you guys did drop points, but like lose, and then yeah. they let you guys come back and 
it was, ter- it was two terrible goals. The keeper gave the ball away for the first one. Actually, no, the second one was a great goal um, from Trossard, but the first one, the keeper just gave it, <laughs> gave it, gave it right to Declan Rice and Declan Rice scored. But yeah, like Chelsea are just they're they're on their own thing right now. Unbelievable, dude! I, I was hoping you guys would lose that game, and then they just shut the bed, dude. It was. I mean, it's so fun to watch. I mean, if you tie to Chelsea nowadays, it feels like a loss. So I think those are two points that we compete. <laughs> That's fair. Um, well, I want to be mindful of your time. I know you're extremely busy, um, so I'll wrap it up there. But uh, thanks, thanks again for joining me. I really enjoyed this conversation, and hopefully our viewers can can also learn from it and enjoy it as well. Yep. Thank you very much for having me. This is, this is a great conversation. Thanks for taking the time out of your day to listen and support this podcast. It is very much appreciated. Please follow the show if you don't already do so. The show can be found on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, and the rest of the other major platforms. As always, be kind to yourself, be kind to others. Much love. This show is produced by Yak Awak and original music by Scott Holmes. 